20 million deaths, 21 million casualties is what it took for the people to question the path of civilization. Up until the World War, the patriarch or the collective conscience of the governing power told us what the goal of our society was. Art, literature, theatre, architecture, performing arts, etc. were pawns in the game of power and influence. Art was a tool in the propagation of a certain type of elite lifestyle and religion. It was an act of service to God and inspiration was drawn from the divine alone and perfection was strived for. Literature developed as a means to document history and important political events in minute detail. Performing arts in theatre was a means of entertainment for the elite. Architecture enabled this lifestyle by providing the required infrastructure. Ornamentation in architecture was a mere utensil to evoke or manipulate emotions as required by the higher power. There was progress in these fields and no doubt there were styles and forms that developed. But that was just the byproduct. The main goal was to represent or convey information about tradition and culture as realistically as possible. The typical aspiration of the ruler to expand territory caused colonization. Colonialism interfered with the development and documentation of every other civilization. The victims of this were left with weak roots in both cultures. There was disorder, but this also led to the blending of cultures, styles and lifestyles. This situation gave an opportunity to the various cultures to exchange knowledge. By the 1900s, the world was revolutionized by electricity, combustion engines, the incandescent bulb, the automobile, the airplane, radio, x-rays, etc. The world shifted in two distinct ways. Man realized that there were no limits to what he could do. Secondly, the world became fast-paced, owing to the invasions in the fields of transportation and communication. Philosophy was also changing. Due to the scientific discovery, Albert Einstein put forth the idea that told us that every person on the planet was bound by the same laws of physics. Yet, there is no such thing as universal time, and thus experience runs very differently from man to man. This made man think. A worker was a mere cog in the machinery of mass production. He felt encouraged. All of this transform politics and economy as well. Seeds of capitalism, socialism, nationalism, anarchy, fascism were already sowed by this time. There were flaws in the system and differences in ideologies. The Great War was inevitable. This war was backed by technology and advanced ammunition. A war so devastating had never been witnessed before. To add to this, 50 million people died from the influenza pandemic. The series of unfortunate events left the world dumbfounded and traumatized. People left behind everything that they believed in to start a new life in the cities. Cities like Germany, Holland, Moscow, Paris, Prague, New York. They wanted to contribute to the making of a better and progressive world. Some of them were atheists and some were finding new meaning. The time and energy they once spent in religious and social obligation, they now spent pondering on and perfecting their craft. They didn't want any system to harness or restrict their creative process or curiosity. They rejected convention and history. They were the modernists. Modernism not a style, not an aesthetic. Modernism a set of revolutionary ideas. Modernists wanted freedom. Modernists wanted to unlearn and begin again. They embraced 
experimentation they open their eyes to observe other culture around the world modernism was a movement that occurred gradually over the span of late 19th century and early 20th century but the revolution was felt most post the great war modernism applied to virtually all form of creative expression art according to modernists had become too concerned with irrelevant sophistication and convention this had distracted it from its true purpose that is discovery of truth gustav corbe exhibited everyday life events through realism claude monet took it outside and captured movement and effect of light in everyday life through impressionism van gogh through post impressionism style interpreted the world by expressing emotions in simplified colors and definitive shapes instead of duplicating what he saw cubism distills constructivism explored abstract art basic forms geometry color and austerity the dada movement portrayed anti war concepts and the salvador dali surrealism was all about exploration and imagination Minimalism extended the idea that art should have its own reality and does not need to imitate anything. Modernism brought about the age of the isms. Most of these movements were independent endeavors to explore styles and techniques. The various styles had very little in common, but they all came under the modernist movement as all the artists strived to find new ways to interpret and realize the world. That's something red The sidewalks in the street The concrete and the clay Beneath my feet begins to crumble But love will never die Because we'll see the mountains tumble Before we say goodbye My love and I will be in love eternally That's the way That's the way it's meant to be All around I see the purple shades of evening Shadows fall and once again on my arms So tenderly The sidewalks in the street The concrete and the clay beneath my feet Begins to crumble Modernism and architecture was an evolution of design that manifested the new lifestyles. The change in structures first appeared around 1850. Some say it began earlier than that and continues to this day. Early modernism emerged in response to a new world of machines and artists that thought a new of their environment. These new designs embraced the use of plate glass, cast iron and reinforced concrete for buildings due to the industrial revolution. These structures were stronger, taller and lighter. Sir Joseph Paxton's Crystal Palace in London housed the great exhibition. It was a breakthrough of its time. The structure was design driven and was one of the first buildings to have cast millions of plate glass windows supported by cast iron frames. The facades were completely glazed. The visitors were left astonished with its clear walls and ceilings that did not require interior lights. Elsewhere in St Denis Paris, the first residence built of reinforced concrete was designed by Francis Cornet. Meanwhile in Chicago the 10 story home insurance building was the first steel framed skyscraper designed by William LeBron It weighed only 1/3 as much as a 10 story building made of heavy masonry He solved the problem of fireproof construction for tall buildings by using masonry iron and terracotta flooring and partitions Most of the early buildings had non functional facades in the neo gothic neo renaissance and beau art styles and structures and revival styles kept popping up time and again but one could also see small strides being taken in the direction of change and rationality the austrian postal savings building in vienna was a different world altogether otto wagner rejected the curvaceous and dynamic but futile elements of the art nouveau style and embraced the rationality of nuts and bolts and stable and dignified order Wagner promoted the idea that architecture must strive to give frank and straightforward solutions to architectural problems. 
in which disciplines of function and structure must play an increasing and attached ornaments a decreasing role. In Barcelona, Antonio Gaudi conceived architecture as a form of sculpture. The facades of Casa Paclo in Barcelona had no straight lines. It was encrusted with colored mosaics of stone and ceramic tiles. He tried to replicate the forms of the structure with shapes and forms abstracted from nature. In the US, skyscrapers appeared as a response to land shortages and the unreasonable cost of construction in the fast growing American cities. In addition, the safety elevators invented by Alicia Otis solved the problem of accessibility. Louis Sullivan in the United States and Auguste Perret in France pioneered the construction of various monumental structures and skyscrapers using steel frames and reinforced concrete. It is the pervading law of all things organic and inorganic of all things physical and metaphysical, of all things human and all things superhuman, of all true manifestations of the head, of the heart, of the soul, that the life is recognizable in its expression, that form ever follows function. This is the law. Frank Lloyd Wright created architecture that reflects nature and exhibits the same amount of unity as prevails in nature. The structure was created as a single organism where various spaces with peculiar character and function came together to form an organism. This later came to be known as organic architecture. During this early stage of modern architecture, some architects tried to abide by classical principles and proportions, and others found stability and order by embracing new forms and rationalism. The 1920s in Europe, Russia and United States was one of those rare periods in the history of architecture. New standards were being created in architecture. The style that was developed was called the international style. Lee Corbusier was born in 1887 and was 20 years younger than Frank Lloyd Wright and a generation younger than Hoffman and Ferret, and almost the same age as Walter Gropius and Mies van der Rohe. He had the habit of close study and observation of nature and its beauty of simple geometrical forms. His exposure to the arts and crafts movement allowed him to dissect the classical forms and proportions and explore basic forms. He attempted to cut through the anatomy of past architecture to reveal principles of organization and to relate plan and shape to dynamic and sensuous experience of volumes in sequence and in relation to setting. His architectural style evolved into the international style. While some of the crucial foundations for modern architecture had been laid in Germany before the war, the preparatory work had to wait until the mid-1920s to come to fruition. Walter Gropius, who founded the revolutionary Bauhaus in 1919, and Mies van der Rohe, who led it further, were criticized for the supposed anti-German, anti-human, and mechanic character of their architecture. Eventually, they immigrated to the United States. Their progressive ideas came with them. By the beginning of 1930s, a common style could be observed across Moscow to Milan, from Laola to Japan. Buildings of different functions, size, material, meaning, and expressive power could be found, which still had obvious features in common. One could speak of the shared characteristics in terms of recurrent motives like strip windows, flat roofs, grids of supports, cantilevered horizontal planes, metal railings, and curved partitions. One could define the general qualities of the style by more abstract features like recurrent tendency to use simple rectangular volumes articulated by crisply cut openings or to emphasize hovering planes and interpenetrating spaces. Moreover, they claimed for this new international style to be of major historical significance. In just 21 weeks in 1927, 17 of Europe's most important architects, such as Walter Gropius, Peter Behrens, and Le Corbusier, 
under the banner of Jyotsa Work Fund, built an experimental residential settlement called the Vizinov or the Dwelling. The model villages was part of an exhibition, Dai Wanang, meaning the flat. In Mies van der Rohe's Weizenhof apartment building, designed in 1926, Mies began to resolve the opposition between structure and form by means of steel frame, the first time that he had actually employed one in structure. Among the best known buildings at the Weizenhof estate are the single house and double house by Le Corbusier. Both buildings with their roof, terrace and bright airy rooms embody Le Corbusier's theory of proportion. They demonstrate his functional maxim of a new architecture, according to which houses are not representational objects, but utilitarian ones. Thereon, modern architecture twisted and turned to accommodate the various new patterns of life. The international style had some adherents as well, who only partly understood the underlying principles and who adopted the forms as a new external dress. In such cases, modern forms became a sort of cosmetic application rather than the expression of deeper meaning or function. This was one of the dangers of speaking of the new architecture as a style at all. It suggested that a set of visual formulae could be picked up and then applied. Perhaps the work of Dutch architect William Dudok, or in France that of Robert Mallet Stevens, supplies as an example. Or as William J. R. Curtis puts it, competent stylism. Each was capable of making modern reductivism a sort of pleasing simplicity, which was nonetheless lacking in the transcending visionary content or the authentic modern movement. And then there were the die-hard functionalists who believed distinctions like these were not relevant. All style was, was false imposition. In the late 1920s, the engineer philosopher R. Buckminster Fuller designed an aluminium house around a central mast of mechanical services. He claimed that this Dymaxian house was far more tightly related to functional and technological optimization than the cosmetic or one might say aesthetic production of modern movement, which he rejected out of hand. Some remarkable works of modern architecture were also conceived at the time. Villa Savoy is a modernist take on French country house. It is a demonstration of Le Corbusier's belief in the home as a machine for living in, a concept based on his admiration for well-built automobiles and transatlantic steamships. The house expressed his five points of architecture, the key feature he felt necessary for modern architecture. These included pilotes that lift the building up above the ground, a flat roof that could serve as a garden and a terrace, open plan interiors, ribbon windows for light and ventilation, and a free facade independent of load bearing structure. The effects of the Second World War was beyond measure. All the masters of modern architecture were still alive, and so were many of their guiding ideas. Thus, there was no going back. Modernism transcended all. From Rio de Janeiro to Sydney, from Tokyo to Beirut, the inheritance of pre-war architecture began to pop up. In part, the spread of image was encouraged by the internationalization of trade with the United States supplying many of the standard emblems of modernization. In part, it was a matter of indigenous elites seeking a break with either earlier 19th century colonial tradition or else with early national or regional tendencies which they found too restrictive. In some countries, for example England and Brazil, it was a matter of extending what had already begun pre-war. In other countries, for example, India or Australia, modern architecture had to begin from scratch. Modernism spread across the world at different stages of maturity and depth of content. Modern forms first entered a local scene, then as a foreign body was received, rejected or accommodated pre-existing cultural matter. So what is modern architecture? What has it taught us? 
Robbie House, Villa Savoy, Barcelona Pavilion, the Town Center at Setne Sayo, Kimball Art Museum, the Church at Bagsworth. These are among the many buildings in the modern tradition to possess such extraordinary depth. Modernism gave us concepts like less is more, form follows function, and other gems. These modern structures portray a language of architecture in its most authentic form, that is, a blend of practicality, aesthetic, and symbolism. To slot them into modern movement is to miss much of their value. It was this timeless character to which E. Corbusier referred to in 1923 when he wrote 